Can I start? Okay. Good morning, everyone. Let's just have a seat. And, okay. Um, I'm Shlomi Alfasi from uh, Context Swim, which is an uh, HP company, a company that was acquired about a few months ago. And we are doing uh, what we have done for HP and also in HP, we implemented an uh, SDN controller, which is based on open daylight. And what I'm going to show today in the about half an hour uh, is how we implement one of the use cases of SDN, okay, the service function chaining, which is one of the six that we are currently working on, okay. Um, so, and I want to show you also what we are and how we are different than other implementation that currently uh, other vendors are implementing the way they implement the service function chaining. Um, okay. So, as for the agenda, I will start to understand first what is service function chaining. I know that probably some of you was in the previous uh, session and I will try to go a little deeper inside to understand what service function chaining is mean. And I will show several approaches, the traditional that was introduced before the SDN, another one, the one that is used currently in uh, open daylight. And after that, I will describe our solution, which is subscriber aware, and I'll explain the difference between our implementation to the previous ones. And once we understand all what is subscriber aware of service function chaining, I will try to go a little even deeper to our solution. What we at Context Stream, what we have done, how, to, how we try to solve this problem that, it, that the subscriber aware is uh, introducing. Okay, so I'll start with the very high level defini uh, definition from the ITF. What is, uh, uh, what is the, call it the dictionary definition uh, of the term service function chaining? So service function chaining is actually uh, used to describe uh, the way we want to introduce a, a set of change in the network and how we steer traffic into them. Okay, so, and a service can be firewall, can be load balancing, can be a lawful interception, any kind of a, a service that the vendor wants to introduce to, to its customers. Okay, so when we are saying service function chaining, we need to understand where we want to place it and when it should run. Okay, uh, in a carrier uh, environment, we are we can distinguish between the over see over here you see the left side where this is where the traffic of each subscriber is running. It could be a mobile network that goes until the PGW, and it can be a cable network, um, optical network, or whatever. Uh, each one of these networks has its own, you can call it the edge router, before the, way, the place that we want to introduce the service function chaining. And uh, on the right side, you can see that this traffic can go either to the internet or maybe into internal application of the vendor itself. For example, over here we can have an IMS application that uh, the vendor is uh, introducing to its customers. Um, and over here you can see a set of service functions. It can be a content filtering, video optimization, caching, or whatever. All of them is something that the, the carrier wants to introduce to its customer, and we want them to be part of each one of the chains. Okay. As I said, I, want, uh, I will go over several approaches that uh, we have to, imp to implement service function chaining. And the traditional one is the one that we have until now, uh, before SDN. We have physical boxes uh, which the carrier, if we want to introduce uh, a new service, has to put a new service in line like with all the others. It means that, in, for this example, if we want to introduce content filtering, we have to put it somewhere in line, 
okay, with all the others, and each subscriber that traffic from his mobile uh, device to the, to the internet, his traffic somehow needs to be passed through this new service. And all of them are physical devices. This is the, what we have done, what we have so far. And the problem with this approach is that, as you probably imagine, each one of the subscribers is affected by a new service that introduced to the system, which means um, um, as long as it and doesn't matter if you're going to use it or not, or you, this subscriber got a service that's supposed to use this function or not, his traffic will go through this uh, f uh, service function. And Another problem that the carrier has with this approach is that each one of these uh, service functions need to be scaled to the top because, because all of them are using, all subscribers are running through this uh, function. It means that all the bandwidth that uh, this function will receive is the full bandwidth of all subscribers. And you can introduce lightweight uh, function unless because all the traffic is supposed to go through them, okay? Um, and another problem that when one of them is failed, it means that everything is blocked. Uh, all of them are in line. One of them fails, it means that the traffic cannot continue and everything is stopped. Okay, so this is the traditional approach. Then SDN came. Uh, and I'll show how SDN in ODL is actually uh, implemented. Um, ODL, Open Daylight, it's an open source uh, uh, controller. Um, it has its own plugin for SFC. Okay. Uh, it uses uh, the ITF spec to uh, follow the uses the ITF spec to in order to implement it, um, and ODL SFC is using something that it called NSH, which is an uh, encapsulation that we add inside to the packet itself. Okay, in order to distinguish with b between chains along the way, the way. So over here you see a set of uh, um, blue boxes. SFF in this case is the switch, okay, service function folder that know how to uh, identify an NSH encapsulation and forward the traffic according to this uh, encapsulation. Uh, classifier, which is the point where the traffic of the subscriber enter the, the network. This classifier, whenever it gets a new traffic for a new subscriber, the first thing that it does is actually classify its traffic to a specific NSH ID. Okay? Once it, the traffic uh, was classified, uh, the packet was marked with this ID, and all the elements along the path know how to forward uh, uh, the traffic according to this ID. So in this example, you, will see, you see that uh, SFF1 is actually because it has the purple SFC encapsulation, you need to forward uh, to SF1 and then when the traffic gets back, he forwarded to the next, uh, next switch and the next switch is forwarding to the second function. Uh, in this approach, uh, we the classifier is pre-configured to a set of uh, NSH IDs. Each one of them is uh, mapped into a set of chains, a set, uh, to a set of services in the chain, okay? And this one, the, uh, this is statically configured, okay? You have a set of IDs which map to a set of chains, uh, and it's not dynamically changed according to, uh, you know, traffic, heavy traffic in the system, and whenever you want to introduce a new one, you have to re reconfigure the classifier, reconfigure each one of the service function to identify the new uh, NSH and to know what to do with it. Um, and okay, so this is the 
advantages and the, what uh, and the sage is capabilities and challenges. Um, one of the benefits that you have in this RFC, okay, uh, in order to better forward uh, data in this chain, um, NSH introduced and the metadata that you can add to the packet, okay, in order to notify other elements in the chain how they should forward, maybe to have a better uh, uh, decision other than the NSH. So you can add another metadata into the packet and the next element in the chain we can use it to forward maybe differently. And when you are using NSH, it, mean, yeah, uh, it means that the transport between the switches is uh, transparent for you. We are using, they are using the basic um, headers to forward traffic between the switches. So this is one of the advantages. And the challenges in this approach is that you need that each one of the network functions or service function in this case uh, need to know how to handle NSH, this encapsulation. You need to encapsulate, uh, de-encapsulate the, um, uh, the header from the packet and not all of them are currently know how to do it. This is something which is not, uh, you can't expect a network function which is already running and implemented that not going to be changed to introduce a new protocol for him. Okay, so it's very hard to use a currently exist network function as part of the chain. Um, this can be solved by an SFC proxy, okay, that actually know uh, how to encapsulate and de-encapsulate the packet. And and uh, this proxy is running between the SFF and the service function. He know how to handle the NSH and continue from there to the service function as a trivial, regular packet of uh, um, that's running in the network. And this is from the service function point of view. And another problem is that OpenFlow is not support, currently not supports uh, NSH, at least at version 1.5. It means that you need also to kind of manipulate the packet in order to use and currently exist uh, uh, switches. Okay, so because of all this uh, limitation, um, we at Contextium decided that we want to go to a different approach, uh, which is sub subscriber aware. And in the few next slide, I will explain what does it mean to be a subscriber aware. Um, okay, so let's start um, with this flow. Uh, over here, you can see uh, in the left side, you can see the PGW, which is uh, in the mobile network, the place where uh, all the traffic of the subscriber entering the um, um, the list of service, fu the service function. And in this setup, we have a set of uh, network function, available network function. We have the TCP optimization, the video optimization, content filtering, and uh, analytics uh, collection. Uh, if you remember in the, the first slide about the trivial, uh, the traditional approach, uh, in order to follow traffic between the PGW and the firewall, we have to go along each one of these hopes. Okay, so now we have, uh, let's say we have two subscribers, the purple one and the red one. Whenever uh, we want that the purple one will use the TCP optimization and uh, video optimization, URL filter and bypass the analytics and not, uh, will not get into the analytics. And, and we have another subscriber, this one, the red one, which only use TCP optimization and the URL filtering. Okay, in this approach, each one of the subscriber will not be interfered by the other one. Okay, uh, since we are not using analytics at all, analytics will not get any traffic. Okay, um, and 
these two subscriber traffic is running uh, in parallel without interfering each other. Now I want to a little go deeper to see how the data flow. Okay, we use the con first in the previous slide. We have the controller, okay, that know how to configure the traffic inside this network in order to achieve this uh, chain, these two chains, okay. And once this uh, configured in the in the switches, we want uh, we'll see over here how the traffic and the data is actually flowing. Okay, so I'll deep dive only to one of the one of the hops just to see which uh, how we use the switch table and the rules inside the, this open flow switch to forward the data. Um, okay, so I illustrate the traffic between the TCP optimization and to the URL filtering. Um, over here, we are using all this uh, vSwitch uh, that we have are currently running, and actually not uh, just the vSwitch, also the, uh, the VNFs and the controller, all of them are running in, uh, inside an OpenStack. For we, OpenStack is not aware that we are running something special that for traffic. For OpenStack, we are just a set of VMs that uh, he loads. We use the Nova to load them, and to and uh, Neutron to configure tunnels between uh, between a set of OpenStack tunnels between uh, data centers if we need to go between data centers. So, like that. Okay. So we started with the TCP optimization. Okay, the VNF. The VNF uh, returns traffic for uh, for a specific subscriber. And first thing that we are doing is just going to a subscriber switch. Now, this subscriber switch is open flow switch, a regular open, uh, open flow switch with a set of table. The only difference between the subscriber switch and the tunnel switch that will, I will talk about it later, it's the size of the table. Okay, uh, all of them are using the same mechanism of match from other si from one side and do an action on the uh, uh, as a result, like any open flow rule. Um, but subscriber switch is handles millions of uh, of uh, rules. Okay, because each subscriber that we have, okay, and let's say when if we are in a, a large scale setup where the carrier has millions of subscribers, each one of these uh, subscribers has its own rules in the switch, and we need to have a very efficient switch that will know how to handle uh, large-scale tables. Okay, the current implementation of this switch now are very uh, optimized to a data center uh, application, which are uh, has uh, have not too many uh, five tuple matches to look for, um, since we are just forwarding to a server, a set of servers, uh, not a limited set of servers, and and which are not dramatically changed. Okay, they are pretty much uh, static. Uh, when you go to subscriber, uh, subscribers are connecting, disconnecting. Rules are uh, added to the table, removed from the table, and and you need to have a, a very efficient switch that know how to handle it. Um, currently, um, one can say we can use the top of rack switch and we can use the hypervisor switch to install uh, something over there. And the current implementation that we try to use was not efficient enough. Okay, so and we. We are in context. We have our own uh, vSwitch that run in uh, on a VM and that can handle this well, up to 100 million subscribers and uh, with very low latency. And latency, I'm talking about something about uh, tens of micros per subscriber. And and okay, how now that we know what. Uh, um, how the subscriber, which table the subscriber is using, we need to understand how it actually forwards the, the data. 
Okay, so each subscriber will identify subscriber by its uh, IP address, okay, and maybe the VLAN that it came to, uh, came from. So, and the first thing that we are doing in this subscriber switch uh, in the rule table, we are trying to match uh, the IP, the and the interface that this subscriber is came from. Once we identify this subscriber, the action that we need to do is probably go to a different uh, different VNF and and go. So we get go back into the um, um, forwarding uh, engine and probably we need to decide in this case that we want to go to a different data center. We need to, under to identify which tunnel we want to use in order to continue. So we have a tunnel switch which is uh, actually the same uh, vSwitch, uh, different tables that we are match uh, this tunnel switch only by the interface that we came from. Not, uh, this is not a scale switch. Um, and the action of this, uh, of this rule in this tunnel switch is where to go, uh, which hardware switch we want to use, which tunnel we want to use in order to forward to the next uh, VNF. And in this particular example, you can see that the subscriber switch and the tunnel switch are separated, but basically we can in have them in the same, uh, in, in the same uh, open flow switch. It depends what access do we have to the entire network. If we can configure the, the hypervisor switch, the vSwitch and the hypervisor, or in the top of rack, we may consider to put the tunnel over there, okay, and um, use the high capacity of these elements. If we cannot, because any reasonable reason, okay, we can put uh, and join these two switches in into a one process uh, and combine the subscriber switch and the tunnel switch into a, a single switch. Each one of them is using a different tables, so there is no overlapping in the information and um, there shouldn't be a problem to run uh, both of them together. Okay, so once the tunnel switch uh, uh, decided in this case that he want to go out of the network and maybe go in this case go to a different da data center and, and a different open stack. Uh, we are forwarding the traffic into the hardware switch and from the hardware switch it's just go in the same path until it gets to the URL filter. Um, okay. So okay. Um, what are the challenges? Okay, it's nice to say that we want to handle millions of subscribers, uh, but there are challenges that came with that. Um, first, first of all, the first challenge is actually the, the number of subscribers, the number of rules that we want to introduce in each one of the uh, open flow uh, tables. Um, I talked about that, that uh, switches have some capability uh, issues with this uh, number of uh, rules. Um, so, and it's not just the number of the rules, it's also the number of changes. Uh, in a mobile network where um, users are connecting and disconnecting, uh, it can get up to a thousand and tens of thousands of changes per second. Okay, and this is something that subscriber aware approach need to handle. And I will show later how we uh, solve these problems. Um, Multi-data center. Um, as you know, OpenStack today um, has some issues with multi-data center. We need to overcome them and to see how we forward between multi-data center. We are using a federated controller between them just in order to move traffic uh, efficiently between uh, different multi-data center. And since we are a carrier-grade uh, solution, um, we need to have a very efficient and uh, uh, high availability and uh, redundancy. Each one of the elements in this uh, solution need to be redundant 
and can start with the VNF, the controller, each one of the switches, um, and all the connectivity between elements need to be uh, redundant and high available. And I have a slide later on how we uh, how we manage this issue. Um, another challenge is to reuse VNFs. Okay, even though they are uh, virtual VNF, virtual network function, um, and we can load as much as we want. Um, eventually, at the end, we want to reuse uh, VNF to a set of chains. Okay, we don't want to introduce per chain uh, network function. Uh, this VNF should be shared between uh, between chains, um, and we want to use physical as well. Okay, we want we don't want our chain to be uh, agnostic to physical or, v or virtual. Um, and this service function uh, approach uh, just forward the packet into this element without ever knowing if it's a virtual or not virtual. And this way we can reuse a network function that we currently have and not, we're not mandatory, must uh, change all of them just because of this new approach. And, and this subscriber aware uh, approach uh, overcome the limitation that we have in the ODL uh, approach, which is using the NSH. Uh, in our solution, there is no need to understand and to encapsulate the encapsulate uh, NSH header from the packet. We are forwarding it just according to um, IP, MAC, any traditional uh, uh, protocol that we have. Okay. Um, and the advantages. Okay, once we we'll finish with the um, challenges, what we gain from uh, being a subscriber aware. Um, um, actually, we are using the SDN fabric to do it. Okay, uh, it means that um, SDN know how to control the traffic and forward uh, into do, uh, forward into a specific network element. Uh, very transparently, and this is something that is an advantage for us. Um, we can uh, enable and deliver uh, services per subscriber, which means uh, we can introduce a new set of change very easily, very dynamically. And this is not just for um, um, to satisfy customer needs. It's maybe also for introducing new services uh, as a carrier, you want to test it before you try it, before you provide it to your customer. Uh, once you isolate a specific uh, chain just for your testing, no one will going to be interfered by that. Um, and this is something very important. And uh, security as well, uh, the same way you can introduce a new service chain, you can disable a specific service chain without interfering all the others. Uh, other approaches in the traditional one, if you stop one of the elements, it could be uh, block the entire chain. In the NSH, it means that you probably shared uh, with many other subscribers and changing this uh, chain will affect all the others. Um, in this subscriber where everything is very easy to, uh, to be automatic um, and to, okay, and very elasticity. I uh, will not go over all these details, actually we talked about it in the previous slide, so I'm kind of repeating myself. Um, okay, so now we, that we understand a little bit more about uh, subscriber aware, um, I will a little go deeper to see, to show you how we in Context Stream in HP, uh, how we solve this uh, uh, problem and what we have done so far to make it a carrier grade uh, uh, solution. Okay, so a little bit about the architecture. 
Um, we have the network uh, network layer, and it's an um, in the left side you can see the uh, mobile network. Uh, in the middle we have the um, underlay, which is the connectivity between our elements, and after that it's actually the network itself. Um, between um, between these two elements, we have overlay network, okay, which is uh, actually configured. It can be configured by the OpenStack. It's a set of tunnels, and whatever tunnel we want, it could be MPLS, uh, GRE, VXLAN, or whatever. Um, when it's actually a connect between OpenFlow switches uh, between the two sides of net the network. Um, Okay, on top of them, we have the context control, okay, which is an, the SDN controller, SDN controller, which is based on uh, open daylight. Uh, it's a federated controller, okay, which means it can reside in several data centers, different data centers, but still act like, an, uh, like a one. They know this controller know how to talk one to each other to get a better uh, performance and to uh, utilize better the network. Um, this controller is uh, configure each one of the switches using the open flow. Um, this is what we have right now, but basically as long as there is an API from the switch, we can configure it in uh, any way that we want. Um, now, uh, we talked about that this, uh, the controller are federated, but there is no direct connection between each one of the controller to, to another. Um, we are using a mapping service, uh, which is using a distributed data database uh, to propagate information from, um, from one controller to the other. Okay, this... Uh, and the information in this database could be um, uh, scale tables like uh, subscribers, okay? Uh, subscriber tables are measured by millions. Uh, if a single data center handle uh, can be located, let's say, in the east coast of the United States and handle a portion of the subscriber and the other one uh, it's in the west coast and uh, handled the other portion. Um, the mapping service uh, which uses LISP is located identification separation protocol. Uh, we want to use and be able to identify each one of the subscribers uh, across all data centers. So uh, we are using a distributed database that know how to propagate uh, all the information uh, between the nodes. Each context control is um, accessing a specific uh, context map, which is an interface into the mapping service. Um, okay, so each one of these uh, threesum is uh, of switch control and map. We call it a context net node. Uh, a context net node is located in a in a single data center. And as you can see, these two data centers are, uh, can communicate uh, one to another. Um, and the limitation that we have, it's not kind of a limitation, but the issue that we have in OpenStack that uh, uh, when working with the multi data center is solved by uh, this approach. Uh, we are using the um, capabilities of a distributed database to propagate information between two uh, or more um, OpenStack data, uh, OpenStack instances. Um, as for a northbound of this uh, uh, solution, we have a set of uh, a broker, and it could be a REST broker, it could be AAA if we want to uh, identify new subscriber and learn about new subscriber from a AAA server. It could be Radius, it could be uh, GX, Diameter, uh, whatever. We have a broker for each one of them. 
Um, we have uh, a context uh, management that expose uh, uh, the information like any other management, uh, UI, CLI, and we show the configuration uh, of this entire system. And, and we have a context which is a performance tool that know how to collect analytics and uh, additional information from our system. Uh, on top of all this, um, we, we are using OpenStack, and it doesn't have to be necessarily OpenStack, but this is what we are using right now, uh, to create all these instances. Each one of these box, blue box over here, is actually running in its own VM. Um, and we are using OpenStack, the Nova OpenStack, to introduce new one, to create, new, uh, to create an instance, to remove, and uh, to actually to manage their life cycle. And ad in addition to that, I mentioned it earlier, um, all the overlay connectivity, the tunnels that we are using, um, and the connectivity between the component themselves internally, uh, we are using also the Newton to configure all this uh, connectivity. Okay, um, as is this a solution for um, a carrier grade solution, okay, uh, the major thing that we want to handle is failures and high availability. Um, in order to, in a regular case where uh, this, let's say it's, uh, this rack is uh, handling uh, a set of VMs which are, um, belong to application, uh, which and it's not carrier uh, applications. Uh, in case of a failure, and uh, high availability is most of the time is solved by the application themselves. Okay, if you are running in Amazon and some one of the rack is failing, um, Amazon know how to handle this failure and their application uh, know how to recover from it. Uh, in a carrier solution, um, situation, you can't afford uh, losing a rack because once you lose this rack, it means that millions of subscribers will lose connection and will be uh, interfere. Okay, so uh, we want to make our solution very uh, efficiently high available. And right now, you will see that. We talked about each one of the ContextNet node, uh, and we sh I showed you that each one of them has a control map and a switch uh, in order to make it high available. Uh, each one of them is actually in the same node. We can have a set of instances of uh, each one of these elements. Uh, this actually gave us an N plus one uh, um, active uh, all active uh, instances of uh, each one of the elements. Uh, whenever there is a map uh, failure, uh, we know how to connect to a different uh, a different map, and and once this map is uh, going up again, the distributed database know how to sync it again. Um, as for context control, uh, it's. It is a federated uh, controller, and uh, once one, uh, well, one of them is going down, uh, and it doesn't affect all the other because the work is uh, split into another controls. Um, and as for the switches, we are using um, a redundant, um, a redundant uh, connectivity uh, uh, between them in order to make sure that in case of failure, uh, we, won't get, uh, we won't be affected from that. Um, okay, so once the w I talked about a controller that can fail and how we make sure that uh, uh, it's not interfering us, in each one of the nodes, we have uh, a leader Okay, and this leader, its responsibility is actually to uh, split the work between uh, all the current uh, controllers in its node. And this way, we, um, 
um, can re reduce the um, the load from a single controller. Okay, um, this controller is actually doing a very simple work that identify which one of the controller should handle uh, uh, the work that need to be done, because we want to have. Um, we want the, the controller need to configure the switches and the, the efficient way to do it is to make the controller that very close to this switch okay in the same hypervisor in the same uh, probably in the same node and we need to select the the uh, appropriate the best one the best one of the controller to do this job this is the what the leader uh, needs to do and it's a very simple uh, work of dispatching uh, and the work to other controllers. In high availability, in case uh, one of the elements uh, of the controller uh, failed and stopped working, the leader identify it and just stop forwarding uh, traffic uh, to this controller. Uh, and in, in this case, nothing is going to be harmed because of a failure of controller. Um, As the connectivity between the switches, we have uh, um, multiple underlay paths, okay, for redundancy. Uh, we can allow that if a single uh, pass is failing to stop all the connectivity, so each one of these uh, elements are having um, at least two uh, redundant passes. And if the same goes for the broker. If uh, we are learning about new subscriber from uh, Radius, okay, so and so we need to have a duplicate uh, multiple uh, Radius listener. Each one of the broker is uh, highly available, and we can do the same in each one of uh, of its instances to do the same job. Um, now, as for for a VNF VNF failure. Whenever um, we are not just configuring um, a single path for each one of the subscriber, we are configuring uh, two or more. So in case one of the VNF fails, um, the alternative path will start working because the switch will identify that uh, it's not uh, the path to this uh, network function is not accessible, and we'll use the second uh, uh, the second path. Uh, so. This way we cover uh, high availability for all the elements that we have. And this is kind of level of um, availability a carrier grade solution should have. Um, okay, so this is for uh, high availability, um, how we gain new um, uh, improve the scalability. Um, we are talking about having uh, several uh, context nodes, okay, in order to uh, better utilize the network. We don't want to have a single node that handle all the millions of subscribers in the same place, uh, and we con we want to make them as close as possible to the actual subscriber exist uh, where they are actually exist. Um, so we can introduce this is a, a distributed solution. So we can introduce a several uh, hundreds of uh, uh, context nodes. Uh, in each context node, uh, we have, as I sh showed before, a set of uh, context controls. And and since uh, context control is open daylight based and is Java based, we have our own limitation. Java has its own limitation. Uh, regarding garbage collection and memory footprint. Uh, so in the same VM, context control VM, we can have uh, several instances of uh, several JVMs that running the controller code. Each one of them is limited to a lower memory fo footprint. Um, so in order to reduce as much as we can the and the garbage collection effect on the entire system. Um, scale out for VNF is 
since everything is a VM, we can scale out uh, as much as we want. We can introduce new VM, uh, collect them as a group and just forward the traffic into this uh, VM and we can support up to a thousand uh, VNF interfaces. Um, okay, um, this is pretty much it. Um, we are running uh, a demo downstairs in the HP booth that show exactly what I show over here, how dynamically we can add uh, new services to the system uh, per subscriber. So thank you everybody, if you have any questions. Thank you. I can hardly see you with the <laughs> light to my face. Okay. <laughs>
uh, for your IP, I mean. Uh, and it shouldn't be interfered by other. If there is some kind of failure in the network, okay, that make your traffic, I don't know, blocked or something like that, uh, we have troubleshooting in order to see it. Uh, but you, should be, uh, you shouldn't be affected by others. So if, in, so in case of failure, it's probably not going to um, um, harm only your session. And we have a mechanism that identifies the state and the accessibility of each one of the network functions to see if your network function is, I don't know, fail. We know how to move you to a different network function with the same capabilities, of course. Uh, and to maintain your session uh, as much as we can. Okay, thanks. Okay. Um, so ah. uh, how do you uh, identify subscribers? Uh, you, know, you, you mentioned IP address. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, are you using anything else in addition, in addition to IP address? Yeah, uh, it's still working. Ah. Okay, it's okay. Um, I mentioned the AAA broker. Okay, the AAA bro broker is uh, something that the PGW, for example, a PGW notify our system by radius message uh, about new uh, uh, subscriber that introduced to into the network. And part of this information it could be usually we are using the IMSI, the IMC uh, ID, and the IP address. But basically, we can have what, whatever we like. Uh, the basic concept of LISP, uh, which is a location identification separation protocol, it's, it's the basic concept over there, it's that it, it's not just IP. Okay, IP is the traditional way to identify a subscriber because most of us are using IP, but basically it could be whatever you like. Okay, so um, we are identify subscribers uh, in our system also by an uh, IP plus uh, IMSI uh, because in the NAT, uh, NAT networks uh, um, you can have the same IP address uh, for different subscribers. So the uh, uniqueness is gained by using also the IMSI of the subscribers. And I think we are over the time for the next one. Ah. So maybe we can take it offline in the conversation. Okay. So how do I unwire myself? <laughs>